You know, in basketball, there's a phrase um, about playing the game. That is, you've got to play above the rim. And um, when you play above the rim, it's easier. You know, if you're, if you're down on the court, there's just a lot of hands, feet, bodies, uh, you know, trying to get to the goal and trying to do stuff with the basketball. You've got to get up above the rim where it's clear and you have a clear view of it. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, that's gotten harder uh, because more and more people are playing above the rim. But, you know, <clears throat> that, that phrase is, is in reference to playing above the rim. You get a clear view. You get, you get better access. Um, you're able to do more when you play above the rim. And so, um, Christians, as Christians, we're to live and to rise above the fray of life. Now, if you get down here where all the bodies and hands and feet are, you can get caught up with that and get all tangled up and, and kind of get distracted about everything. But um, we're, to, we're to get above the rim in, in Christianity. We're to get above up there and, and be where God is. So, mount up on wings as eagles. Hallelujah. Soar above the fray. Amen. And just really trying to say... Uh, that we're to rise up in Christ and live in the spirit realm every day. And, and so we can get a clear sight at the goal. Okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is living above the rim. These are about four or five points here. Uh, it won't, it, we're not going to stay here long, um, long enough. We'll stay long enough, amen? Amen? <laughs> amen. All right, hallelujah. Pastor Ed Bobblehead said Amen. That's probably going to go to my office where I'll play with it all the time. <laughs> Look over in Habakkuk, the second chapter, please. And uh, in this church, they should not be, your Bible should not be stuck together back there. Hallelujah. I know some places they, they don't even know where Habakkuk is. It is in the Bible. Amen. How many, how many know it's in the Bible? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And um, I was going to turn there myself, but I'm thinking I'm just going to read from my, where I have it in my, and my iPad, hallelujah. It is one of the shorter, the short books, you know, they kind of all, you turn too many pages and you run right by them. How many, how many have you ever experienced that? You, you go, you turn three pages and man, you miss five books. Hallelujah. Habakkuk, the second chapter, verse one says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and I will answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision Make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, it shall not lie, though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now that almost sounds like double speak there, but understands here, it may seem like it's tarrying to you, but it's not. That's really what he's saying there. It's coming to pass. Okay? Now, God doesn't measure time the way we measure time. We measure time in, you know, how long it took you at the fast at the at the the, the, uh, the drive through? We think it's the express through. You know, it's a drive through. You know, sometimes you pull up there and, and listen. If you go through a drive through and you get it the second you ask for it, usually that means either they're really really busy or they cooked it way ahead of time. And uh, you don't want it cooked way ahead of time. Amen. <clears throat> really really busy means they're cooking a lot of stuff all the time and it's just all com constantly coming up and you get it. But a lot of times in Christianity, when we pray, we expect to have the express through. We expect to drive up and boom, it's there. And even, the, even a fast food restaurant today is still faster than what you do at home. I mean, if you're going to cook fried chicken at home, you've got to go home. You've got to get the grease hot. You've got to get the chicken cut up. You've got to get it battered. You've got, you know, seasoned and battered. Then you've got to put it in the grease. And if you've got a little deep fryer, it'll take 15, 20 minutes, depending on, you know, how much you put in at one time. In the frying pan, it can take 45 minutes to, to pan fry chicken. 45 minutes to an hour, to cook, you know, especially if you've got a big old thick breast or something. No, I'm talking about bone in. It can take an hour. So we kinda, we're conditioned in life. If you have homemade mashed potatoes, you've got to take the potatoes, you've got to peel them, you've got to cut them up, put them in the water, boil them, take them, mash them up, mix all the stuff into it, get them right. That takes a good 30, 45 minutes. Now, Hungry Jack Instant Potatoes or whatever brand you use takes long enough to boil the water. Whatever that time is, there you go. You just dump it in, mix it up, and use it for wallpaper paste. Hallelujah. Now, I'm better because what I'll do is I'll keep putting cream and milk in it until I get it down to the right consistency, you know. And so it's usually about twice what it calls for in the milk or cream area uh, because it just takes that much to thin it down for the pasty, you know, status. Cat says, no wonder he's getting so fat. Eat now. <laughs> Hallelujah. So <clears throat> we have a mindset of everything happening so fast. But the Word of God does say, though it tarry, wait for it, it, uh, um, um, it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, Basically saying, in your time frame, it may seem like it's taking a long time, but in God's time frame, it's coming right on time. Okay? 
So don't, don't get uptight. So here he says, write the vision. The vision is for an important time, but at the end it shall speak. In other words, it will come to pass. God's, when you write it down, when God births in your heart, when you write that down, that's, what, that's the plan you're following. So we've got to set, we set the goal. We've got to set the vision out there. You've got to write it out. Amen? Amen? You've got to say it. Now listen, folks, we are, we are a family church. We're, 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 we're believing God to do things in the earth. We have that written down. We have to begin to run with that as a congregation. <clears throat> You've got to keep looking to what God has for us to do. Now it's making, making changes in the earth and helping people and doing the word of God so that we can get the, the purpose of God done. Amen? First, the first thing to do if you're going to live above the rim is you've got to set a goal. Now a basketball team, when they go out, they do not go out to lose. Unless you're the team playing the Harlem Globetrotters. Then you're supposed to lose. Okay? Otherwise, I think they've, they've lost one time in the last 3,000 games or something. And this mess, I mean, you know, how could that happen? You know, it's, it's all set up, you know, um, and all the stuff they do. But it's, it's, you know, did you know they actually played the NBA for two years as a real team? Yep, back in the late 50s or whatever, they, they decided they wanted to be a real team, and they got to play in the NBA for a couple of years. And um, then they went back to being the clown team. <laughs> I don't think it worked out too good. Can't do some of the antics they were doing in, the, in real games. Hallelujah. All right. So, you know, you, we, have to, we have to set a goal. Our goal is never to lose. Anybody ever had a goal to lose? Anybody ever had a goal not to make it? Anybody ever, ever had a goal? Now, listen, you know, I know people who start companies in their homes, you know, small businesses, and they want to lose money uh, on paper so that they can, you know, write that off as a tax thing. I'm not talking about that. You know, because even then they're still, they're still making money. They just write off enough stuff that they actually made money although they lost money on paper so the government can leave their, tax, their money alone. And I'm with them. I don't want the government taking any more of my money. Uh, they've taken enough. Uh, if you don't think so, just, just mail them your extra. They'll be glad to take it. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, we want to win. I think it's in, a, in every person, they want to win. They want to be the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. They want to go over, not under. Are you here? They, they, their, their desires in life are, are winning. You know, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. God, we're, it is a matter of always being on the winning side. As a believer, you're supposed to be on the winning side. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we set a vision. We write it down. We, just, we, just, we declare. Now, let me say this. You declare what you want to win, but it has to be biblical. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to say this. Real, I'm not going to put a whole lot of time and effort here. You've heard me say this enough. You can't make winning somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband. Or getting all their stuff. That's not biblical. So, always understand when we're talking about winning, we're talking about obtaining, we're always, we're always talking about within the parameters of what the Word of God decrees and declares to us. You can't go out here and be a dummy. You know, I got a trillion dollars in Jesus' name. You can't even believe to fill up your gas tank. Come on now. Let's get realistic about this. Set your goals in the arena of, of, of where you're starting and then increase them as you achieve them. You know, you'll, you'll take a sports team. One thing they want to do, in, 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 um, uh, you'll take a team that's horrible, you know, and, you know, and you're bringing in a new coach. They want to turn things around. They, they pro Chiefs. Where's Larry? Go sit him, Larry, and let the Duke Blue Devil and the Kansas City Chief guys sit together. Um, their goal usually is not the Super Bowl next year. It is, it is to build, to, to take care of this aspect of the team that's messed up, get that fixed. And then, they're gonna, then, they're gonna, then once they get that working right, they're going to they're add over here, and they're going to get this part of the team fixed and working right. And, you know, maybe, maybe if they had defense, offensive problems, special team problems all over the place, they focus in on one. So they'll go to the draft. We need a quarterback. You know, I know we need to work on defense, but we've got to get that quarterback first. And they're going to build, and they're going to turn things around. In our lives as believers, we need to set goals and start in areas. Okay, I really need help. In, I need help in healing. I need help in finances. I need help in walking in love. You know, you need to find one of those things and focus in on that and get that going. And once, once you're achieving, now listen, I can't say you're not working at all on the others, but I am saying, you know, in order to, to turn everything around, you've got to start working somewhere. And set a goal there. Just to think, I'm, I'm going to be a completely different person in 30 days. It's probably not a legitimate goal. In other words, you know, let, let's set a goal that we can start working towards. And putting our energy into, spiritual energy into, believing God in that arena. And then as you turn that around, then you can start adding the other into it. Well, I got my, I'm going to get my love wall straight now. Now I need to get my finances. Well, you start working on your finances. Don't let go of the love wall. That's part of, the, that's part of your building block of, of getting everything to being Christ-like. Okay? 
So we're going to set visions and goals out before us and, and make, put them in, in places where you can, you can see them to achieve them. You've got to have a goal that you can see. Don't put a goal so far down the road you can't see it. You can't look at a goal if you can't see it. If you put an unrealistic goal out there, you'll put it so far down the road you can't focus on that thing. There's too much in between. All right? We're talking about playing above the rim, being able to see the goal where you are. You know, you can't see the goal in the other arena. <coughs> that went over big. All right. Second point is once you've set the goal, once you've written it down, once you've made the commitment to go to a certain direction, you've got to commit to it. Well, this is what I want. Well, what are you going to do about getting there? Look over Luke chapter 9. That is over. in the place with a bunch of red letters if you've got a red letter Bible. Looking down around verse 59 or so. <coughs> it's Luke chapter 9. We'll start in verse uh, 57. And it came to pass as they went in the west. A certain man followed them and said, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have the air. Birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Let me stop here. Just, just a little side journey. People use this to say Jesus was poor. Now, he was in a different town. He didn't have a place to stay. It did not mean he didn't have anything. Why? You don't have a treasurer if you don't have anything. Okay? If you go out here to the street corner and find somebody's got a sign that says, we'll work for food, roll down your window and say, who's your treasurer? He's going to say, are you crazy? I don't have any money. That's why I got the sign up. We'll work for food. No, 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 no. Jesus was poor. He had a treasure. You ought to have a treasure. No, you don't get a treasure until you got too much money to handle. You, you, you um, relinquish that responsibility when you get more than you can handle. You get a financial advisor when you can't handle what you've got. All right? You get, you know, you get, a, you get a, a treasure. You get somebody to take care of stuff when you can't handle it. If it's 50 bucks, you can handle it. You don't need to hire somebody to handle it. Listen, there was so much money in the ministry that Judas was a thief and nobody knew it. Hello, the Bible says he was a thief. And there was so much money in there, they just didn't know he was, he was skimming. Hello? How do you think they were feeding that crowd? The only time... Now listen, I'm, talking about not, I'm not talking about the crowds of people that were fought, I'm talking about the ministry team. And at least at one time, we know he had at least 70 disciples. But he had more than that. We know he had more than that from, from studying. We, we find out. You know, he had, he had, you know, he had Mary, Mary Magdalene, all those. And, but the 70 just went out as part of the, the, um, the advanced team. The 70 that went out two by two, they were the advanced team. He was, taking, he was, he was housing and taking care of 70 people. He, just, he got in a place where he did, there was nowhere to stay for some whatever reason. And so they came to him and said, I'll follow you. He says, well, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has to wear layers. I need a place to sleep. All right, hallelujah, and uh, where was I there? And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, allow me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead, but thou go and preach the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me go first bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. He said, no man having put his hand to the plow in looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And then after these things, the Lord appointed 70 and sent them two by two before his face in every city. Now, so here we have Jesus telling two people, you don't have time. You know, and listen, you're, if you're going to commit, commit. Sell out. Now, this, this is not a main thing about you know, renouncing your family. Don't ever have anything to do with your family, yada, yada, yada. This is about selling out. Don't let things hold you back. Don't keep things out of the call and the purpose and the plan of God. Amen. Don't, you know, don't let human relations and human constraints keep you from going forward in the plan of God. Amen. I've, I've seen too many people miss things in life because they let human relationships hold them out. Or human relationships come, somebody come and tell them, well, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, I, you know, they, somebody always knows better than you. They always got a word for you. I believe in words. When they're given by the Holy Ghost... When they're not given for the purpose of establishing that other person as an authority in your life. See, God does not give words of wisdom or words of knowledge from the gifts of the Spirit in order to establish the authority of an individual in your life. He gives them to you to help you. And if what the end result is that person has established a place of authority in your life, 
Because of that, it was the wrong thing. It was the wrong spirit. They use it as a manipulation tool at that point. You know? Pastor's not your Holy Ghost. Now, he can be used with the Holy Ghost, but he's not your Holy Ghost. Amen? God will speak to me, but I'm not your Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. Amen? Have a vessel in his hand. Praise God. Now, there's, there were also, we talked about this, they shared some this morning about, you know, respecting. I, I was kind of thinking about going that line tonight, but I didn't do it. About honoring and having respect. There, the, we, we can get into some of those things, but, you know, at the same time, you know, don't over-position anyone in your life. Amen? You know, we should honor those set overs in authority as far as our pastors and, and those who, who the Lord says so they can give an account for your soul with joy. At the same time, you know, they're not God. They don't walk on water, and, you know, and they're not the head of the church. Amen? Your spirit, your spirit. My job is to teach you how to be led by the spirit and maintain a, a proper biblical respect for the office and the gift. But you, you still have to be led by the spirit yourself. Amen? You have to hear from heaven. The spirit of God has to speak to you. Now, in, in, in the guidance issue, God will use, use the pastors or those set over you to help, help you through difficult times and understanding and, and, and navigating difficult waters and, and getting clarity on things the Spirit's speaking. Hallelujah. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, people call me and want me to, almost want me to get the get for them, and I won't do it. Not, not, sometimes I'll know what it is. But I see, I've got to help them navigate and find out what it is for themselves. So I'll, I'll point them in that direction. I'll say things to get them to go in that direction, to look that way, so they can hear for themselves. And then they can come back and say, well, I think, yeah, well, I, I knew that. That's what it was. I just, but you had to find out. You had to find out. Hallelujah. So, uh, and, and listen, that comes with maturity. Ministries, that comes with maturity. You find out, you know, at some point in time, you can't be everybody's Holy Ghost. Um, and you don't always have all the answers. Or you sometimes you're not even supposed to give them the answer, even when you do know it, so they can find out. Because they've got to grow. People have to grow. Amen? How to? Okay. So, but here we have, you know, Jesus basically saying, get committed. You've got to get committed. Did you know commitment's not always fun? Anybody ever committed and think, well, you know, I, here, here, you know, Wednesday, um, somebody, somebody called, like I said, I went, I went to Florida to, to be at the funeral. Somebody called me Wednesday morning and said, when's the funeral? I said, well, I, you know, I just talked to Karen yesterday, and, and she th said it's probably Friday or Saturday. She hoped it wasn't going to be Sunday. I said, but I'll find out. So I, I sent her a text message because she was, you know, I thought she might be at work. And um, I got back one about 20 minutes later. Uh, it's tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Jesus! Amen. Well, that was just, that was, you, know, and so the, you know, they wanted to send me to Florida. They wanted to help, you know, some other people wanted to get involved and send me down there to represent the church. We talked about that this morning. But, and so I started looking for airlines and that stuff. I didn't get it settled until about 11 o'clock, 11.30 on my end. This started at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. It took us that long to get it settled and get the ticket purchased and all the stuff established. Well, then I was out of here at, at the airport at 6 o'clock Wednesday night. I got to my hotel at 1.30 Thursday morning. I said, it took that long, you know, for flying, getting in the rental car, driving from the airport, because it was in Port St. Lucie. I flew into Melbourne. It was a little over an hour drive, but you've got to get the airport, get off the plane, go get the car, yada, you know, you know all that stuff. It takes time to do all that. Now, I didn't land until 11.46. So I landed at 11.46, and I got into my hotel room at, at 1.30. And um, got up at, at about 8.30. Now, I didn't, you, uh, if you think I just went to the hotel room and fell out, went to sleep immediately, if you've been running like that all day long, airports, sitting on planes, all that stuff, you're not, you don't just go in and go, sleep, you go in there and go in. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're kind of wired up, you're kind of geared up, you can drink a Coca-Cola's and, you know, all that. As a matter of fact, I got one in on the front desk on the way by. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> so got up, went, went uh, and, and so got up about 8.30, got showered, got dressed, got all my stuff packed, went down, had a little breakfast down at the little bre you know, breakfast thing there. And the, and the funeral home was about four and a half, about four and a half miles away, so then I, I and just drove right over there to it. Didn't miss anything, didn't miss a turn. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Got there early. Got there, supposed to start at the uh, viewing 11. Got there about 10, 20, 10, 30. Um, and then, you know, Mark and Kathy were there already. And uh, when I walked in, Car I mean, Kathy just broke down. She didn't know I was coming. I didn't tell anybody I was coming. Uh, she just broke down bawling. And then a few minutes later, I had, they said, well, we want you to speak and lead the altar call at the end of the service. I brought my iPad. I got a Bible on my iPad. Okay? So I go to the car to get my iPad out because I, I got to, I've got to get some stuff ready to share and to, 
and to give the altar call. The insert. They had asked the pastor. He was a, what they call a congregationalist pastor, and, um, and, and they don't do that. But they had asked him to, and so he agreed to. Well, you can imagine how, much, how effective you'll be when you agree to do something that you really don't do. Right. You know? So uh, I went out and got my iPad. Well, I'm going to get put close in the trunk. The, Karen and Brooks drive up with the kids in the back. Brooks sees me and waves and smiles. Karen saw me. As soon as she saw me, she broke down. She broke down so bad that they went back and parked behind the building and sat there for 15 minutes before she would even come in. She was completely, they just lost it that I was there. Then, then the family found out. So, you know, all this, and I did the, fun- did the things in the funeral. And just, it really ministered to their family that, that you would send me, and just, you know, down there to, to minister. Um, their, her brothers was just taken back. Um, of course, they were, you know. And um, so we went out to eat after. We didn't get done until 1.45 with the viewing and the funeral. Uh, about 1.45 until we went, to, you know, went out to eat Golden Corral. And, um, and then by the time we got done, it was almost 3.30. I had to get in the car and drive to the airport right back to the airport. So I drove back up to Melbourne, turned the car in, went and sat there, waited for my flight, got on my flight, went to Charlotte, sat in Charlotte for three hours. I had a three-hour layover in Charlotte. I could, I could have walked home. <laughs> well, maybe not, but I could have. I mean, if I had known I was coming in and going to get in that early, I would have called somebody and said, meet me in Charlotte. I mean, they could have been there eight, when I got there. I could have been home two and a half hours before I got home. But anyway, well, while I'm driving back from Port St. Lucie to Melbourne, I get a phone call from Weston Academy. We need for you to sub on, uh, tomorrow. We've got three PE teachers out. We need you in there. Can you help us out? And I went, yes. When I said yes, I was committed. I got home at 11.15. I landed at 11.15. We had Tom Cruise and Iceman in the cockpit. We took 19 minutes from wheels up to wheels down from Charlotte to Greensboro, and they came in hot. If you've ever flown, you know what I'm talking about. They came in, boom, somebody in the cockpit's got a date. I'm telling you, I think they came in at 500 knots and hit the runway. Boom, tail hook grabbed it, pulled us and stopped us. I'm telling you, I mean, shoom. Airport, yeah, Air Force pilot. So anyway, you know, Jesse's at the airport to pick me up because everybody's got to get up early to go to work next morning. So do I. Why? Because I said yes. So I told, them, I told them when I called, I said, look, give me, I know you got all three teachers. Which one has the latest first class? Because, you know, they, the, the different PE teachers have a, a different, they, they do work in the mornings if they don't have a class first thing. Well, they said, we'll be here at 830. Well, I get there and find out that I didn't have to be here until 1025. The one I was substituting for didn't have his first class until 1025. I thought, man, I could have slept. But I'm sitting, I'm sitting there driving that morning. I said, what idiot said yes? Because I didn't want to get up the next morning. You can understand. You, you hear my timetable. You hear it went like boom, 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 boom. I did pass out. Somewhere around 2 o'clock in the hotel room that on that Thursday morning, I just completely passed out. It didn't, didn't, I mean, it was just like, <laughs> I walked in with a hammer and went, Whack! Woke up at 8.30, and I'm like, I don't want to get up. Have you ever done that? Oh, I don't want to get up. I just don't want to get up. But I thought, God, if I close my eyes, I might sleep right through the funeral. I mean, then, then that's going to look really bad. I would just, I would just got in the car and drove home and never let them know I was there. I just told everybody in church, well, I was there. <laughs> Near. <laughs> I was in the vicinity. But what happened was I gave my word, I gave a commitment to the school, and although I didn't want to get up on Friday morning and go, go there because I had been running wide open since, since uh, I got a, what time did somebody, somebody text me on Thursday, Wednesday morning like 7.30 to ask me that question. They got the whole thing going. I'm not going to look at them. But if they had we wouldn't have got it done in time. I mean, it had to be done. But, uh, you know, so I've been going on this, on this thing for since 7.30 on Wednesday morning, just wide open, about six hours sleep. And that I had to get up on Friday and go co- follow, fulfill my commitment. I didn't tell all that just to be telling. I told you that because, see, commitment means we keep our word. We stay faithful to that which we promised. And we do what we're supposed to do. And it's not always going to be easy, and it's not always going to be pleasurable. But I, they, 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 I saw the uh, middle school principal uh, during the day, and uh, 
He, and then I, and I told the woman to call me. I said, well, look, I'm in Florida. And if something comes up, I'll call you. But, you know, I'll be there in the morning. Otherwise, I'll be there in the morning. And uh, so by the time I got everybody heard, heard out, they called me in Florida coming back to, to sub. And the, um, the middle school principal says, yeah, we heard we had to chase you down. He said, but uh, we had all three PE teachers out. And I told them, we have got to get the big dog in here. <laughs> See, I, 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 I've subbed so much that I'm kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the authoritative main sub for the PE department. I know, I've suffered all of them. I know how to do it. The kids love me. They call me Big Dog. That's my nickname. Because uh, it's, it's just, we, I've kind of done that with the kids. So I'll see them years later. They'll, they'll be out of, uh, out of the PE program, and they'll see me. Big Dog, what's up? I mean, that's my nickname. And, so the, and the little kids will come in. I've had them since kindergarten. Now they're in fourth grade. It's Big Dog today. I mean, so that's my nickname. I'm the Big Dog. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> but they needed me there to help. And so they, they were letting me how much they appreciated me coming in. And although I, I mean, my flesh did not want to do it, it was a help and an aid and a blessing. And I keep my word and doing what I said I would do. Had I dropped the ball on them and said, I can't make it, I'm too tired, they would have been scrambling to find somebody in that situation where they didn't need to. You see, see, our commitments are important because people count on us. Let me say this, the Lord counts on you. I know this is all a natural story. It took a long time to tell it. But you see, here, here's, here's, the, here's the moral of that story for us. When we commit to the things of God, when we commit to a church, when we commit to a ministry, you're counted on. Even when it's difficult on your flesh, and everybody has flesh, if you don't, you're not here. If I'm talking to you and you are hearing me, you got flesh. Okay? Just want you to know that. And sometimes it'll get up and talk to you. Uh, it don't really mean anything if you show up or not. Yes, it does. I am going to diverge from my notes. Is anybody surprised? <laughs> Hallelujah. Look over with me, if you will. Yeah, lack of commitment to my notes. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Well, Hallelujah. Let's look over into Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We'll just we'll pick up down here in verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning crafting, that's whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Did you know that you are a supply? And making increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love? Now stop here. He says here, compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working uh, of every part, making increase of the body into its edifying of itself in love. You are a supply. Your commitment to the ministry, to the church, number one, is to be a supply. You don't supply well when you're not around. Can you imagine if the supply truck for our troops was sitting at the depot and not driving out to where the troops were? Oh, we need more ammo. Where's the supply truck? Well, we decided to sleep in this morning. What happens if that happens in battle? If those who supply your, your, your replacement ammunition and supply the things you have to have to fight the battle, if they don't show up, what happens to them? They die. Now, it may not be as drastic in, in coming to church and so forth, but it, it can because, you know, spiritual things are real too. And there's a mean devil out there. And you, you, you are to be a supply. But I, but I have so many needs myself. Yeah, but you know what? One of the greatest ways to have your personal need met is to give. And then the Lord will restore and, re and refresh, refresh and refurbish you. He'll, re he'll resupply you. There'll be fresh supply for you. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Dead Sea? Does anyone know why it's called the Dead Sea? Okay, Bible school student, put your hand down. Other Bible school student, put your hand down. Bill, you can't answer. 
Okay. The reason it's called the Dead Sea is there's no outlet. The Dead Sea has rivers that flow into it, and, and it's one of the richest places in the world for minerals. They just flow in there, but there is no outlet for the, the Dead Sea to go out. Nothing lives in it. You can't, you can't go fishing. It just don't work. It's just it's full of minerals and stuff. And the reason is there's no out. And you see, that's what we refer to as the Dead Sea Principle. In the life of a believer, if all you're ever doing is having the river of prosperity and the river of life and the river of health and or got the river of, of Fred Price and you got the river of uh, Creflo Dollar and the river of Kenneth Copeland and Jerry Savelle and Jesse Duplantis and Pastor Ed just flowing into your life and there's no outlet, you become rich with supply that doesn't supply. You're a depot, but you're not supplying. So therefore, you, you, you know, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, how many of you have ever seen the, the old John Wayne movie? Um, uh, oh, gracious. In Harm's Way, him and Kirk Douglas. You know, it's a black and white, you know, World War II Pearl Harbor movie, you know. And, um, and one, of the, one of the admirals, Admiral... Oh, gosh. Forgot his name. He was played by Andrews, a guy named last name of Andrews. And he was a real chicken. He would always supply stuff and keep stuff back and hold back and wouldn't put, wouldn't put what they had available to the hands of the soldiers. He would keep huge supplies back and wouldn't release it because he, he didn't want to get caught shorthanded. Now, the first thing that happened when John, when John Wayne was, when his advance to the temporary rank of rear admiral was he started getting all that stuff. So they could win. They were, they were caught up on, on, on an island and sitting. And this is kind of based on, somewhat loosely based on, on real, real military history. Not, not totally accurate, but uh, uh, loosely accurate, okay? Um, and they were, they were hung up on Navuana or whatever. And they were pinned down for weeks because they weren't getting the planes. They weren't getting the supplies. As soon as he unleashed the supplies in the planes, they went there and they just took it in like a day. Boom. You know? So in other words, they were, they, were getting, they were supplying a depot, and they were doing it, and they weren't using it, and so the supply wouldn't go out, so nothing was getting done. In other words, the very purpose of the supply depot was being thwarted and wasn't functioning and doing what it's supposed to do. You are a supply depot that is to supply. You know, compacted by that which every joint supplieth. You are to bring your supply to the table. What for? We will use the supply, and then you'll get resupplied. And God will resupply you, and God will, God will put more back into you. You know, is your giving, he will give back. That's a principle of the Bible. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down. Not just money. If you give your faith, if you give your, your supply, God will bring more supply back into you. When he knows you will use what he gives you, he'll give you more. I don't believe that. Go look at the parable of the talents. You got the guy who got five talents, got, got, got two talents, and the guy that got one. And, and then the man went away and came back later. And the one who had five talents went and trained it and did more and got ten more. Got ten all together, so he doubled it. And, you know, he says, you know, here, Lord, you gave me five, I got ten. He said, you know, he basically says, you know, enter into your rest. You know, you've done well, good and faithful servant. Guy got two. He went and doubled it up to two. And, you know, the, Lord, and the, Lord, the master said, you know, well, look, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you know. And so he, he, got, he got the same reward as the guy who, got, who, who doubled his five. The guy who, then the guy could have one. Man, I knew you were tough. I went and hit it. And here's your one back. He said, you knew I was a difficult and austere man. He said, you should have put it to the changers and made money on it, but you didn't. He said, take from him that has, give it to the one who had the most, and throw him in the outer darkness. Wow. Why? Because we are to be suppliers. God has gifted every one of you. Just take your hand, put it on your heart, and say, God, say it, God, come on now, God has gifted me. I am a supplier in Jesus' name. Well, I don't know what my supplier is. I can't see it. Uh, uh, 
Don't say that. You come to the pastor and say, I, need, I want a supply. And he might tell you, go work in the, in the cleaning crew. I mean, we need to, how many of you have ever seen No Time for Sergeant with Andy Griffith? The old movie, you know, really kind of what Gomer Powell was based on eventually. You know, Gomer Powell, USMC. Well, No Time for Sergeant is really kind of the, 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 the prelude to that in the movie world that came up the television. Now, it's not exactly the same, but you kind of get that, that bumbling, you know, private kind of thing out of that movie. And, Griffith, and of course, Gomer Powell is a spinoff from the Andy Griffith show. Y'all remember that, don't you? Okay, he joined the, he joined the Marines, went off. <clears throat> well, Griffith comes in the boot camp, and he's as dumb as a brick. You know, and it drives a sergeant, well, I can't do anything. But he gave him the train duty one day. He came in, <laughs> he walks in, and uh, I mean, it's the, the, the latrine, uh, uh, sparkling. I mean, it, you, it's gleaming. And he even steps on something, and all the toll is, come up and salute. Hallelujah. And, of course, the, the drill sergeant's thinking, he's never getting out of boot camp. I'm keeping him. I've got me a winner here. Hello? Yes, sir. He, he got a hold of that and took even that duty and did it greater than anybody had ever done it before. And was proud of it. We've got to get back to the place that, you know, listen, if cleaning the bathroom, let me tell you something. There's nothing more annoying than walking into the bathroom and it's dirty. Mid's bathroom is, is worse sometimes because little boys go in there and they, they don't quite make the mark. And that's not pleasurable when the floor is not water. Got it? Y'all get the picture? Is that enough of a picture? You know? Well, see, that, that, that should, you know, you got guests, you got Visitors come in, you go in, just not any visitors. People who come to church, nobody wants to go, go in there. To, to, to clean that as a supply. Nobody likes cleaning a diaper. Hello? Even when it's your own kid. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, you remember your kids? I mean, it's like put a clothespin on your nose and go, God, open the windows! Ah! Can't breathe. But you do it because it's necessary. It's what's required. You know, parents need, parents need to be in the, in, the children, I mean, in the services to hear the word also. So we need people to work in the nursery. Well, I don't, I've done my time. But see, you don't, don't become a dead sea and lose your supply outlet so that the Lord can bring more in. You want to be a supply. I know I'm way, way, way off of where I thought I was going, but is this okay? Because you see, you have a supply to give. Every one of you have a supply to give. Amen. And when, and when you give it, not only does it open up the, the, the flow so there's life in you. Now, remember the Dead Sea, nothing grows in it because that's why it's called the Dead Sea. Because there's too much stuff there. So you think you're getting, if you can get enough, you'll be happy? No, the Dead Sea has too much. And therefore, it can't produce. It can't produce life. If, we were to, if they were to channel that out so that it could flow out, you would see the whole environment of that thing change over time. And the same thing in your life. If you'll let that out, you'll see life producing in you and bringing good things to you. Instead of frustration about why you're not, you're not growing or flourishing or whatever. And, you know, you keep piling more stuff in there. You're just going to choke everything else out. There's no more joy than watching what you've given or what you've done be a blessing to someone else. Now, those who helped send me to Florida, I can, let me tell you, what a blessing that was to the, to, to the, fa the whole family. Now, some of the things were said at the funeral. I mean, if, we, if I hadn't finished it up, it would have been left on a very negative note. Everybody, everybody was, you know, kind of sad. It was, now, I, I totally changed the atmosphere. Now, listen, not because I'm great, but that's, that's what we are. We're full of life. And we celebrated. We celebrated things in a way that brought life. 
Amen. Gave an altar call, had the whole place pray. Now, uh, one of her friends came up to me afterwards and said, I'm her, I don't know if she said casino partner or bridge partner or whatever, uh, but I'm her, you know, we, we, you know, I'm a friend. I'm not part of the family. She said, you did more good for her than anybody else that spoke. But, well, thank you. That wasn't my purpose to be better than anybody else that spoke. We wanted to bring life. Wanted to bring joy. Wanted to supply something there that would, that would be life-giving. Amen? And um, have an effect that, that brought life. And we did. Because that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, not Ed Taylor, not, not me personally. You no, know, pat me on the back. We as believers, that's what we're supposed to do. We're to bring life into the circumstance of the situation. We're to be suppliers. Can you say amen? So say it again. Say, I am a supplier. Glory to God. Amen. <clears throat> and so the body is brought together. Henceforth be no more children, speaking the truth and love, for whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted, by that which every joint supplieth. What joy it can bring to your heart to be a supplier. For you to come to church and make it easier for Pastor Ed to preach because there's people here. It's a whole lot easier to preach to people than it is to, why is 99.9% .9 of the church gone and, you know, oh, Brother Bill's on the camera and, you know, and one other person made it in tonight. Hallelujah. Caps comes because he doesn't want to get struck out. I'm teasing it's kind of a joke. He'll, he'll do something, and, and I know it's, that's not how you do it with a woman. You know, that's not what you say. That's not what you do. And I'll go, hoop, hoop. He's like, okay, I'm learning. He's like, you don't do that. Okay. You know, sometimes he gets foul tips. You know, he, he stays in the game. Keeps his back going. Hallelujah. <coughs> Did you know when you come, you add your faith? Your presence adds your faith. So somebody comes in that's weak in faith. Somebody that comes in and struggling because you're here and you've added your faith to the corporate anointing. We're able to more effectively minister to them. Because you've added your faith. So we want you to add your faith. We want you to be a supplier. And I'm going to quit. Because there's no way I'm going to finish this night unless we stay till 9. Who wants to stay till 9? Lord, let's we'll, we'll stay till 9, all right? World Series starts at 8. We're going to 10. Showers! <laughs> he just got tossed. Hallelujah. I'm just teasing. Hallelujah. All right. So we'll pick up next Sunday night. Not next Sunday, morning, next Sunday night. Um, after being committed, we've got a couple, about three, four more points, so we'll get into that next Sunday night. Next Sunday, we'll cover something differently.